great pleasure to introduce uh, Chad Giusti from uh, Penn, who will be talking to us on uh, technology and neural computation. Uh, thank you. Um, so I assume I'm okay. Everybody can hear me. Um, if not, you should let me know. Um, so thank everybody for for coming. Um, I so I was writing this talk uh, after I had sent off the title, and I realized that it was a very different talk. So I'm just going to go ahead and change the title, uh, some of those bait and switch things. Uh, so I'm going to talk about brain networks specifically today. Neural computation is uh, sort of a more complex topic and something that uh, other stuff really relates to, but, but and we'll go past it a bit, but uh, I don't want to focus on it today. Um, and I will show you where we would have to diverge to get there uh, when we get there. So. Uh, let's see. So uh, before I get started, I always want to do this uh, early on because I will invariably forget. I want to thank all the people besides me who did, I think, the bulk of the work. Um, so there are really three separate research groups uh, involved here. Um, my uh, the the people with whom I sort of developed these tools and from whom I got a lot of inspiration are Vladimir Skov and Karina Kurto. Um, and our external collaborator, Eva Postelkova, who uh, gave us the data for the initial project. Uh, currently working with uh, Danny and, and Rob Grest at Penn, and uh, there are various people associated with them. Uh, and some of work will show up uh, throughout the later half of this talk. And uh, Greg Henselman has been doing tremendous computational work, which is letting us see all sorts of wonderful new things. So, and lastly, Anything in here is interesting to you. Uh, if I convince you that algebraic topology should all be doing neuroscience, um, I've kept a bibliography of all the papers in the end of these two fields on my web page. So um, that's hopefully a resource that uh, would interest to be people. All right. So I want to start by thinking about brains. The problem is, of course, that I don't want to do that because it's not like a, a nice, well-defined medical term. Um, and if you ask biologists, you might get a response. This is actually a response I got from a biologist. Uh, you know, it is a biological system which performs computations. Um, then satisfactory. I don't know what to do with that. So I'm going to try to weigh in a little bit here and tell you what I want to mean. First off, uh, with computation today, what I mean is that somehow information comes into the system, it gets organized and changed, and then sent back, back out. Um, that is uh, a definition you're absolutely welcome to take issue with. Um, that's unfortunately one of the fundamental problems is not many of these things are particularly well defined. Um, of course, not for us brains, we like to model them as networks, right? Connect Connected neurons, connected brain regions, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm going to be thinking in terms of networks. Um, and so, here's the point. Uh, it's it's made a lot better, but uh, it's what we've got. So um, it's a network with dynamics sitting on the network. Okay, and it's supposed to aggregate information, do something to that information, and send it away. The key, the, the the this is the 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 hook into which we're going to to place mathematics is essentially the, the network dynamic system. Uh, 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 and then what we want to do is use that perspective in combination with that yeah, it should be doing some sort of computation to try to understand what we see in data that neuroscientists are collecting. Uh, these yeah. Uh, so, all right. So, what I mean by these brain networks? Well, here's uh, sort of I don't know what favorite examples. So, this is uh, diffusion tensor imaging. So, um, this is uh, actual somebody's actual brain, um, and these tracts are locations. These are they, they they studied water diffusion essentially in the brain, and you you sort of see that you know if if everything could diffuse in Sort of an arbitrary direction. You, uh, you know, if there was no structure in there, 
that's forcing water along in, in particular directions more than other directions, uh, you you would just have sort of a blob. But instead you have these these uh, these cell pathways, which correspond in some sense to uh, connections where electricity can flow in the brain. So this is an example of the kind of network that we're talking about. A very high level um, sort of you know, plane network. So each one of those edges is many, many thousands of neurons. Uh, probably is not exactly thousands of neurons, but some correlate to the existence of neurons. And, and it becomes very, very difficult to really understand what you're talking about there. But uh, people do implicate these kinds of uh, networks for uh, in, in, in very good tasks. And we'll come back to them at the end. Um, I'm more comfortable starting at the nanoscale at the very, very small uh, cellular level because I have some idea what the units of computation are there. So they look like this. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures in neuroscience. This is from Jeff Lichtman's lab at Harvard. Every one of those little blobs is L. Um, so this is a chunk of cortex from a mouse about the size of a grain of sand. Um, and so you can imagine it's just an unbelievably painstaking test to, to construct this kind of data. What they do is they do uh, electron mice, cost, mice uh, to, and they slice this thing in incredibly thin layers, and then they use very advanced algorithms to reconstruct it. Um, and so you think, okay, so that looks like kind of a pain, and then they blow it up a little bit so that you can see it better, and you realize that it's essentially intractable and what's going on. Um, but Part of it is that we don't really understand embedded networks very well, and so if you don't make it past the first three minutes of the talk, uh, what you can go home with is we would really like better tools for understanding embedded networks. Uh, we don't have them, so that's an entire area of that I know topologists like think about in you know, embeddings and 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 other thing. Uh, I certainly I, I came from not theory, so I like to think about it. Um, but sophistication to do thing with this day yet. So if you know, looking for a lifetime research project, here's one. Um, okay, I think I can understand that. Uh, but what I can understand is, is the function of that thing, right? The geometry is too hard. So let me look at how the individual cells are functioning and try to construct sort of a conceptual map at that level. And I'm going to rely on people who have come before me who have already done a lot of the heavy lifting. I uh, used to get started. Uh, in particular, we're talking about uh, an area of the brain called the hippocampus. Uh, this is uh, what I initially thought I was going to be studying when I moved to neuroscience, but it turns out that I needed disambiguation. Uh, this on the left is a brain region. Uh, it's a deep brain region that's embedded in things like uh, spatial uh, navigation and also working memory. So there's a lot of uh, very interesting stuff that happens there, and supposedly these two things, the reason that the hippocampus is called the hippocampus is because it kind of looks like this uh, seahorse uh, 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 figure on the right here. But uh, but this this has been very heavily studied, and the reason one there are two reasons it's been heavily studied. One is because of an unhappy accident early in neurosurgery, which uh, caused us to learn that it's implicated in, in uh, memory formation, and I don't want to talk about that aspect so much. Uh, the other reason that we know a lot about it is because of this guy. Uh, so John O'Keefe uh, was uh, a student in the 70s, and uh, this was when we could first do single unit recordings. So we'd insert a probe into the brain of a rat, record a single neuron spiking. Uh, neurons have these spike events where they, you know, it's discrete. Uh, they they hit sort of a, a electrical potential, and you get this this wave that travels down the body uh, of the neuron, and then imparts information to neurons it's connected to. Um, and so, what he do is he would probe, you know, put these probes in the brain, and then it would wander around its its uh, maze. And what he discovered is there are these cells, this, these red dots here in the bottom are spikes from an individual cell as the animal moves around its environment. And so you look at that, right, of course, he essentially out and it was going to be there. So it's a pretty fantastic discovery, and uh, it won him and some 
and other people I'll tell you about in just a second, the, the Nobel Prize in Medicine last year. So, I mean, it's a, it's a big deal. Um, and, and it's fantastic, right? It's this very cell that has no direct sensory inputs, and somehow it records where you are in an environment, which is, so uh, these things are called place fields, and what you can do is you can just sort of convolve uh, the activity with a Gaussian you get a picture of what you call a receptive field, so there's some sort of space. And there on, in every place cell in the hippocampus, maps to a location in the space, and then as the animal wanders around, its firing rate is essentially controlled by its location. So these heat maps sort of give you uh, some examples of, of what it looks like. These are reconstructed from actual data. These things tile the environment, they cover the environment, and if you're willing to accept the tiny lie, they cover the environment in convex open sets, which is why every uh, theory topology should consider neuroscience as a second field. Um, but if that doesn't convince you, here's uh, the other people who won the Nobel Prize in medicine, uh, along with O'Keefe, uh, for their discovery of a neighboring brain region has these things called grid fields. Um, so the cells don't correspond to single locations, and so they form a hexagonal grid, right? So the cell is on and off and on and off and on. Um, and if, again, if you're taking your first topology course, you say this and you say, ah, oh, that looks like maybe it's a tiling with fundamental domain of hexagon, and I've seen that before somewhere. So it turns out that these things don't tile the environment. They tile a torus, just a two torus. So there's, uh, you know, information here. There's an open cover of a two torus in uh, the entorhinal cortex, and you can use your recover homology if you like. So I'm not going to do it today because uh, it's a little more intricate to to, to get into. But uh, you know, there's some trivial topology going on in your head right now. Um, so let's see. So we have this place idea, and for many years it was extremely productive uh, for neuroscientists because it was a handle, right? It was a conceptual description of what these cells were doing. And over time, we've gotten to the point where we can now, right, at the time, do single unit recordings. Now we can do these massive multi-unit recordings. So a few years ago when I got involved in this, the state of the art was a few hundred, uh, or a couple hundred cells at the absolute maximum. Uh, now there are labs using calcium imaging that can do thousands. Uh, in a few years, there'll be millions. So you can study whole neural populations. The people involved with uh, Vladimir Zakov and Karina Kurto, um, who have been talking about this stuff a bit, uh, or, uh, and we're thinking about this in 2008. They're both mathematicians by training, uh, if you don't know them. Uh, they noticed this very nice uh, uh, top level picture, right? If I just record from some of these place cell neurons and ask you who's, who's firing at the same time, right? Then, I construct a simplicial complex just by taking those elements to be the faces. So this would be the Dauker complex for, for the who are interested in that sort of thing uh, of some binarized version of this firing matrix, right? Uh, that, that's a simplicial complex. And since I'm a little bit in claiming that the receptive fields are convex, uh, the nerve theorem tells me I can reconstruct the shape of the environment from the current patterns. Um, Here's a deep brain area that's doing something to the nerve theorem, and I think that's uh, the best named coincidence I've ever run into. So, uh, so this is the point. This, this is why I think uh, there's a ton to be done with topology in this area because it's not an accident. It's not a you know, we're not artificially shoehorning these tools in. These these tools have, have really kind of, the, the, the kinds of representations that combination contains are already contained in the brain somewhere. Um, and so it'd be fundamental building blocks. Um, and I have some strong opinions about that that I'm happy to share um, offline if people are interested. Um, so here we could take the detour I mentioned and start talking about the theory of computation. Um, and how those things relate to algebraic and topological methods. Um, but we just, we only have an hour, so I'm going to talk about data um, and neural data and brain networks and understanding them directly from the data. Um, and uh, Karina's 
um, expository paper. It's the sort of uh, paper part of her math research or uh, defense bulletin from the joint mathematics meeting this year. Uh, you can find it on her web page, um, and it'll be um, published next year sometime. Um, all right. So if I have a population of place cells, brain network as a proxy for the physical network, which is too complicated for me to understand. Uh, so what I'm going to do is sort of a standard thing to do, which is I'm going to take the time series produced by the neurons, and I'm going to construct a correlation matrix. And then if I'm a mathematician and I'm really good at conflating abstract things, I'm going to think of it as a network, right? It's just a way to do matrix. So all of the, uh, just, but it's all, all connected, which is, Occasionally, sort of complex, but it's something that we uh, we can't at least try to get our hands on. So, uh, um, the kind of network that uh, I'm going to at least use as a foothold um, to get started with this stuff. So I should the following thing, and that is that um, the biology data, in the neuroscience data in particular, is extraordinarily messy. Right? Those questions. That, that correlation matrix I showed you, but there's all sort of noise. Um, I only have like an hour of data at most, and I'm only doing, uh, you know, six, seven experiments because it takes a grad student to get one of these things to work out. Uh, and then I have 100, maybe 1,000 neurons, but the brain region I'm working in is tens of thousands or millions of neurons. So I don't get to see everything that's going on. Uh, there's incredibly hard to understand biophysics happening at the actual neural level to causing these electrical responses or at the whole brain level. Nobody even begins to claim to know what's going on there. Um, but if I want to study networks, I'm going to have to be able to go around that. And, and sort of the main thing of all is that everything is tremendously nonlinear. Um, and that is a real confound for traditional methods, right? If I started with a network, and I wanted to, I took it, you know, into my favorite uh, tool set, uh, I would take my mics and I would compute Ike because that's what goes out there, matrices, after all, and I compute eigenvalues, that's, that's what I'm good at. And so we like to pick on Wigner's semicircle law because it's sort of well known. It's one of the first examples, right? If I take a real symmetric matrix and I compute its eigenvalues, uh, if the entries were IID, then uh, you get this nice semicircle distribution for the eigenvalues, um, which is admirable, except if I take that same matrix and I shove all the entries, exact same matrix, shove all the entries through the saturating nonlinearity, um, it breaks everything. So uh, these outstanding, right, these five red dots that are sitting way outside of the, the rest of the system, I might think, well, there's that's a break five matrix. I've found my structure, and I'm off to the races. Um, the problem is that which semicircle law is a limiting theorem. Uh, this is a thousand by thousand matrix, very finite, and so I count on that semicircle to be there until I let go to infinity. Um, and that's, you know, a lab scientist, I don't get to let n go into infinity. I have 100 cells, and that's what I've got. Um, so notation becomes fraught here, right? Heavy-tailed distributions, even ID, tend to mess with the tools, and heavy-tailed distributions are the kind of things that cheat, right? Um, so if I have neural response to stimuli, they tend to have these um, sigmoidal curves, right, where they by responding to the input very much, and then they suddenly take off, and then they saturate. Um, and a similar response happens uh, in fMRI, so the, the bold signal we use to measure uh, collectivity in the human brain, uh, you get this, you know, sort of heavily nonlinear response curve. And these things change not just, you know, full, uh, or from Read to region, but they actually change, like the scan as the as the equipment is curved. So it's very difficult to remove this confound from the system. Um, and as we'll say later, or maybe you already know because you've seen chunks of this talk before, uh, there's 
we expect these responses tend to be monotonic. As the signal increases, the response increases. Um, and that's, that's going to be uh, strangely enough information. So uh, it's the question is, how do I detect structure and networks when I have all of this terrible mess around? Um, and I've talked to you guys, so the answer is algebraic topology. It's great. Uh, it does a tremendous amount for us, um, and it, it's, it's like a biologist a Biologist wrote a wish list of things he would like a mathematical theory to do, and he sent it back in time to like the you know early 1900s where, you know, Poincaré and Pals picked it up and said, oh, we should develop the area of that does this, because biologists have noise, right? There's, just a of noise, the systems are perturbed, there's nonlinear stuff like we just talked about. Um, nobody thinks about biological systems in isolation, right? Biological systems are as a collection of relations, right? Cells talk to other cells. Inside the cell, this protein talks to this protein, and genes talk to genes, and animals eat other animals, right? Everything in biology is about relationships and not anything in the vacuum, but that's the modern sort of a break, topological, category, theoretic point of view. And I think that that as a starting point is tremendously useful for understanding these things. Uh, and lastly, and this is huge for things like, like we have right, a bunch of tiny local uh, operations coming together to form a global phenomenon. Right? These sort of uh, what people call emergent, so I think that may be a term from that may be uh, a way to obfuscate the words, I don't know. Uh, an emergent phenomenon right, is one where you have a bunch of local things and somehow they sew together into a global thing. Well, that's, that's what we're good at. So, so it's, it's not to think these tools are going to work well for us. Okay, so now I have uh, motivation uh, for, for trying these things. Uh, I'm going to tell you that, uh, you know, somebody got to me, got got here ahead of me. Uh, so we have persistent homology, right? Um, for point clouds, that's the standard sort of uh, uh, picture that people have uh, historically. A uh, lot of the study goes into how the properties of these point clouds inform the computation of these various invariants, right? So persistent homology is just the birth of all these loops, uh, as I'm sure most of you are aware. Right? So you think about, uh, for example, the vitor schrips complex. Uh, is a map from finite spaces to these graded modules that sort of contain this information about the births and deaths of loops, and it's done. It's it's computed by computing some push homology of this Viator strips complex, where whenever all of my vertices are close enough together, less than uh, whatever distance scale I'm currently looking at, I introduce a simplex which covers all those vertices. Right. It doesn't give me the faithful homology of the original thing, but it gives me a nice approximation. And so what I'd say is that finite metric spaces are absolutely unnecessary to that process, as many of you know. Right? I could just kill that, that uh, kill the finite metric space, kill the point cloud that I began with, uh, and replace it with some arbitrary symmetric matrix. And here I'm going to choose uh, zero diagonal because uh, suggestion, right? I'm just going to choose to throw away the uh, right, zero distances from a point to itself. Um, so what I've done is essentially thrown away the triangle inequality and its higher uh, uh, higher things that happen in, in metric spaces. Um, and now I just have a matrix, and I'm going to threshold it. Like the large entries, right? The, so I have small to large on you here, but you can take negative distance matrices if you, matrices if you like. Um, and a sequence of uh, simple plexes again, but now whenever uh, the I take a set of vertices, I introduce a simplex. Whenever all of the entries in the associated submatrix away from diagonal are gray threshold, right? it's the same game. I just never have the triangle inequality around to uh, say you know there's a. a, a uh, that there's a relationship between the matrix entries. I can just put whatever matrix entries I want on him. So, yes? Uh, what did the uh, script denote? Oh, it's just for zero diagonal. 
Um, I just want to not think about the diagonal on these matrices at all. Okay, these are, are non-negative? Uh, don't have to be. Don't have to be. I'm just I'm going to let you take any entry or any matrix you like, um, and then you just slide a parameter along the list trees and uh, turn them on. Right, so you can always shift the entire matrix so it's non-negative if you feel like doing so. So zero. So yeah, diagonals just fixed at zero. Okay. Um, Thanks. Sure. Sums contained in the upper triangle essentially. Um, all right. Okay. So this. So to take any distribution, any random matrix distribution like, right, this induces through this process uh, a distribution on a set of persistence modules or persistence diagrams and so on and so forth. And that's going to be uh, sort of the, the start point here, or the method. Uh, and like I said, I didn't get here first. Um, so we on down here. Um, Matt Kale, of course, did. Um, so this is a picture from his, uh, what, you know, one of his very first papers on uh, random quick complexes, because that's essentially what, uh, what we're talking about here, right? So if you take a random quick complex on a matrix with, with I entries, right, um, and you apply this procedure, um, then and this is, here's a matrix with 100 entries or 100 by 100 matrix, um, and he's choosing the entries uniformly. Uh, the Betty numbers run and fall in this wonderful unimodal, uh, distinct way. It's just one of the best pictures, um, I think, in all of topology. Um, and the thing I want to say about this that isn't really caught much in, in the paper is that his access is this probability. Um, it's actually the value in the matrix. Now, they chose the entries uniform on 0 to 1, so those two things are the same. But if... I have the probability. I actually don't care what the distribution was, right? I, if I choose another distribution, as long as the entries are IID, and I, I pick a probability of edges occurring, that's just picking the percentage of the edges that are there. I'm um, picture. So this is actually invariant under change of distribution with the particular x-axis that that Matt chose. Um, and uh, hang on to that because nonlinearity actually floating around in the background, right, in my matrix entries. Uh, so if I just throw away everything except the relative ordering, then these two matrices, this N and this four, are give me the homology. Um, so that, that's right. It gets rid of one of the fundamental things I didn't know how to deal with, these bold signals and these neural responses. Those things are going to be absorbed by just throwing away everything except at the relative ordering of the entries. Um, so I like, to think, I like to call it the edge density, uh, right? Because it's really the percentage of the edges out of all that you can have that are in the uh, in math at each stage. I'm just going to call this the order complex of the weighted, or weighted network. So for, if I give you a weighted network, what I want you to do is compute the persistent homology of its order complex. Um, and that's going to be variant of networks. So, for example, um, right, so let's do a sample a random graph, right? That's a different distribution on the set of random graphs. I'm going to choose uh, point clouds and some Euclidean space. So here I've got 88, so in the example I'm going to show you, I've got 88 points. Um, I'm going to sample the points uniformly in some unit cube for varying D, uh, varying dimension, and I'm going to take, take as my matrix the negative Distances, right? So, so the matrix, the elements in the matrix uh, decrease with this. So, as the points get farther apart, their correspondence goes down. All right, and this is we're familiar, right? This is we're back to the point cloud case here. Um, but uh, I want to say is that this looks very, very different than the picture that I showed you from from math paper, right? So, so here uh, these numbers sitting above the gold peaks are the uh, dimension, right? So it's D equals 5, 10, 16, 24, 88. Um, the gold curve is Betty 1, red curve is Betty 2, blue curve is Betty 3. Um, that's as far as we really need to go for this particular example. Things on it are just fundamentally different from the, 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 the preceding case. Um, and just to really drive this home, so the dots mark the height of the peak curve. 
Um, if I take, I've got a log log plot where I take the dimension of the cube. If I'm fixing n equals 88, I've got the dimension of the cube along the x-axis and the number of cycles at the peak of each curve on the y-axis. Right, what we, and this is just empirical computation, uh, is these peaks saturate an order smaller than the ra random curves had. Or curves hit. And so what I've been told uh, is that if I go out far enough on the d-axis, these things take off again. Um, but I've observed that in any way that doesn't feel like it's just computational error. So um, I think there's some theory in that direction, but nobody uh, it's not well developed. Uh, for cases where D is even in the range of the number of points, right? The tension is within two to the number of points that I'm scattering. Dynique, just looking at the peaks of the curves, tells me that I have a random, a completely random structure, IID, or looking at uh, this sort of geometric distribution. So, uh, so uh, here I'm staying away from questions of, you know, are these points sampled manifold or anything like that? I really want to want to ask a question: Are they just, just right? Is this the answer to the question? If I start with uh, points, this point cloud. Um, and so, what? Oh, yep. Can you find that graph again? So that the peaks. Uh, I mean, going back one. Piece, yeah, one more. Yep. Right? So for a particular dimension, we've got several of these monotonic curves, right? One for each degree of homology. Right. So uh, gold is always Betty 1, red is always Betty 2, and blue is always Betty 3. And you're looking at the, the peak that's the highest among all of those? So I'm, at, I'm looking at the peak of, right, so each each curve is unimodal, right? For blue is unimodal, for Betty 2 is unimodal, for Betty, Betty 3 is unimodal. So the dot... In this, so so no, the dot here is sitting at the peak of the, for example, d equals 88 curve. So on this graph, Sorry. each dot is the peak of the associated curve, right? So these gold dots are in each choice of dimension back here, right? Dimension 5, 10, 16, 24, 88. Here, as you move along the x-axis, I'm increasing dimension. Dot marks the peak of the peak of the mo or the that unimodal curve. Okay, thank you. Can you go back then? So, yep. I mean, there's 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 dimension D of the mm -hmm. box in which you're taking. Oh ah, yeah, so so the dimensions on the x-axis in this plot are D, right? Gold is always Betty one, which is one dimensional or homo dimensional one. And homological dimension. So the numbers, the written down are, are the is the D, right? Right. Yeah. And and, and then on your next graph, you're going to look for a particular D. You're going to look at a you want a maximum, and that, so can you say again what that is? That's going to be the yeah. maximum of So it's literally the maximum, right, so each one of these curves is unimodal. These are the mean over several trials, so you nice smooth curve. Um, uh, so, right, so I get this, so here, right, so for example, on the gold curve, right, so I take just those gold curves, and I stretch them out, out axis, the direction of D, Mark where the height of the maximum is. Okay, I, and you've drawn one each, so the three curves there are for logical dimensions zero, one, and two. Uh, and three. One, three. Okay. Yeah. Great. And increasing D. All right. Increasing D. That's right. So the, the point is that the the homology, right? As I let D get large within any reasonable range, uh, somehow the homology of a point cloud n equals a fixed number of points. Rather, the maximum number of cycles that you observe for each homological dimension saturates. And that the points is uh, just the places where we sampled, right? So I, I did this computation for various d's way out through d equals ten to the sixth. Is the dimension of the box? That's right. And then you're picking some number of points in the dimension of the box. Always n, always eighty-eight in this case. Oh, always eight. Okay. All right. Yep. Um, so, so, so D equals N uh, is not something that's true for all values of D. It's just that's right. Just at one spot, right? So this is saying it does much bigger. The homologies never grow much beyond the case where 
the demand the number of as the number of points, which is not terribly shocking, right? That's not as uh, about generic as you can get for a point configuration. So okay. Okay, so, all right, so but, uh, back to the, the neuro stuff. Uh, That's exactly how we expect place cells to behave, right? I, the correlation between the first and the second uh, cells here that I've got at right, the panel, panel two should be relatively low because the centers of those uh, those peaks are far apart. Right? Whereas if I take two cells, like the first and third, where the center of the peak are relatively close together, I expect it to be highly correlated, the activity of the resulting ones. Right. So, um, in the conceptual model of, of play fields that, that people have put on these things, um, this correlation matrix should roughly be some modern decreasing function of the distances between the centers of the fields. Uh, so in a, uh, if I plug this correlation matrix into my homology machine, I'm guessing it looks like these geometric curves. Um, but this is noisy real data, so let me just take a second and do a proof of concept computation. I'm going to do synthetic place cell data where I'm going to get rid of all the other stuff that's going on in the brain. I'm going to use these these fields. I'm going to generate inhomogeneous Poisson processes. Essentially, I'm going to I'm going to take a path that wanders around inside the space, and to for each non generate synthetic spiking by having an inhomogeneous Poisson process whose rate is controlled by when the rat is in, you know, when the virtual rat is in position X, what's the firing rate of the cell? The maps. I take that kind of data and I do a correlation level that sits right on top of these geometric curves. It is beautiful and wonderful. Like, it, so this jagged, thick line here is 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 such a trouble, and the curves in the background are our Betty one, two, and three for these geometric curves. Um, and for a minute, and if if, if uh, you start it for maybe more than a minute, and you happen to have the other slides in front of you, you flip back and you say, "Wait, let's be on top of the curves for d equals five. But this is a point out something really wrong. And that's the problem working with data is that here are some of the fields, the place fields from this 88 cell neck that we constructed, which are Probably not convex. Uh, right? There's goods for which distance falls off uh, in, in any nice way. So, so and this wonderful, right? So these are four. About 10% of the cells were bad like this. Um, out of the eight cells, like nine cells were very, very bad, or 10. Um, so that, uh, right? They're so insensitive to this kind of perturbation that it still the geometric structure, which is, is wonderful, right? It didn't give us the dimension back, but maybe that's because there's no obvious dimension to this kind of thing. Okay, but you know, that's all it sees. Maybe, maybe there's you know, maybe it's an artifact of the way you did this. So um, here's a nice control, and I think it's a really fantastic control for a couple reasons. So here, what we did, we just took all of those tiles, we did the same thing with synthetic, synthetic time series. We scrolled the maps. Uh, this is a schematic. We actually scrambled them much more finely. Um, like we took the thing, we broke it into a hundred by hundred grid, and then we shuffled it independently for each one of the neurons. Curve is gone, but there's sort of this driving signal. Something really weird happens, and I don't at all. But I would love if somebody did understand it. Gone is still indistinguishable from geometric. I uh, need Betty two and Betty three. A jagged line is still in the Betty one uh, is still sitting right on top of the geometric curves, whereas in the other two, uh, it's exploded off of the off the charts. So in fact, here is an example, and I don't know what Betty two and Betty three mean here, except the statistics. Those are the statistics you need to distinguish this kind of thing, uh, where you've got a global driving signal on your work. Right, the position is some sort of input, and then the output is some very random function of that driving input. So now with a few thought experiments, let's take that data and slam it into the machine. Um, top left is the IID, top right is the geometric, uh, bottom left is the actual recorded data. And uh, what we'll do is we'll just integrate those curves to get a nice summary statistic uh, because 
you know, we're, we have orders of magnitude of difference, so it's easy to just uh, uh, compare that way. And what we see is that one is great, or even if you just overlay, um, the curve looks look just absolutely like the geometric curves, um, which is great. Right? So we can actually suck this geometry, we can see it all of the cells. And that's actually, you know, maybe surprising here. We didn't for cell firing data, I didn't actually use or correlates, but we were able to extract their existence anyway. Um, or the you know a signature which is consistent with that kind of behavior, which is you know just we don't know to falsify things. We don't necessarily know how to say two things are the same very easily. Um, but we can see across behavior, and this is sort of the, the the where that behavioral lack of behavioral correlate comes in. Um, for spatial navigation, right, the rat's running around, we get the spatial structures. All right, so these are just the integrated curves. The backgrounds are the um, geometric regime, and the thick dots are the actual values from the data. Um, we're running, same thing, so that's running in a wheel. Now it doesn't have visual cues, but maybe it has motor cues that tell us it's doing something spa spatial, so the hippocampus could be doing spatial stuff. REM sleep was a big surprise to us and everybody else we told about, because now you don't have any reason to believe that there's something in that brain driving a spatial structure, right? It's not navigating an environment. So why should you be getting network that's consistent with place fields or some sort of geometric structure? And 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 the answer, the only one that we can come up with is this structure is not something by the rest of the brain, but it's actually how this network is wired up. Um, the question that mathematicians always immediately have is, well, maybe the neurons are, you know, maybe you're picking up the structure of the neurons. But it turns out that these these balls are sort of distributed randomly, as far as we can tell, inside the hippocampus. The, you know, two two fields neurons are not necessarily anywhere near each other, even if their fields are near, nearby. So, all this thing about about how the hippocampal network is built, um, and there have been some really beautiful results in the last couple of months which strongly seem to confirm that maybe what the hippocampus does is it aggregates any signal that the animal is paying attention to and embeds it in a low-dimensional geometric space. So it's happening in the animal's brain. It's possible that what the hippocampus is doing is just taking that information and giving you a coordinate system in some low-dimensional space, which is, right, if you petition designing how a brain area would work, that's exactly what you would want it to do. So, so uh, I'm I'm super pleased by those results, and they're they're still in press, but I think they're going to change the way that we think about a lot of things in, in the brain. Um, let me uh, move from this brain example and talk about some more examples. There are uh, 12 further network models. Uh, my student and I is more uh, painstakingly did just an unbelievably large number. Uh, of computations here, right? So that we know it distinguishes. Maybe they're the only two, right? We have a very, a very uh, 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 tool. Um, so here are, are a total of 14 standard nets that people use in neuroscience. Um, and Anne did a, just a ton of computations, and she actually added a few uh, features. So we're not just going to use these integrated Betty uh, numbers, which are are right, uh, sort of these total lifetimes in each tree. Also, going to use uh, uh, these uh, birth weighted uh, uh, version of things. So, you'll recognize these as the um, basis, two, first two basis functions from the Adcock, Carlson, and Carlson paper. Um, and then we're also going to compute maximal clicks up to uh, given sizes that things participate in. Uh, because that gives us some sort of local feature instead of these larger global features. See, when you plug all these network models in, is you get this sort of spectrum of networks, um, ranging from totally disordered networks. So these things, sort of in the space spanned by these features I just described to you, you get this blob that is, uh, you know, where work models bleed into each other. But you can really cluster. If you run a cluster, and I don't think there are four clusters, I think there's some sort of continuum, but these are the models people are working with, and they do cluster. Um, um, disordered random network models, 
max entry models and things like that, um, down to lag models and then things which are literally just, uh, you know, a vertex and all of its friends, uh, some some central hubs that talk to the rest of the network. And of course, you don't get very much homology there, but you get a lot of cliques. So this, you know, to tell someone that yeah, there's a you know, some virtual relationship between the number of cycles you see in a clique complex and the maximum size of a clique as uh, at any given time. That seems like a relatively safe assumption, but it's a, I don't think anybody understands how those two things interact because it gets very hard to understand the, the interactions. Um, but you can do this sort of data-driven approach. And it gives you a way to, to use these homological features to compare networks, right? So I've got these four classes, and then I've also got uh, this panel, these classes, and you just take the centroid in this space. Um, and you take uh, these four model networks uh, that this is two like modular Kuramoto oscillator networks, um, some kind of protein network, and then this uh, DSI network, this brain network I showed you at the beginning. Prior to the machine, you let it grind, um, you get all these homological features, right? These are just new statistics of the persistence diagram, and then you compute distance in this space. Uh, as a proxy for similarity of metrics, and you ask, who am I close to, right? And it, if you look at things, it turns out that all three of these, or all, all of these networks are really, really all, all these uh, uh, of interest are really, really close to class four networks. So then you can break open the class four networks, right, which turns out to be, uh, you know, sort of a broad range of things. That consist of like watt strats and ring lattices and uh, ballistic random geometric graphs and things like that. And then compare, you know, where am I with respect to the centroids of those distributions? So this is just a nice sort of e kind of way to get uh, what I'd call a mesoscale, a, lot, a, a mesoscale picture of the oh. Networks are related, right? How close am I to this network or this network or this network? Um, right. If I'm far away, I'm unlikely to be well modeled by that kind of random network. And if I'm very close to the the center of the distribution, you know, of course you have to do various other statistics on these distributions. But if I'm very close in this space, then maybe that's a very that's a nice network model to use to say the the data that I'm looking at. Yeah. All right. Of course, you know, this method is totally generalizable to, to other uh, other network measures, and I'm sure people do things like this, but uh, I don't really know of any. Okay, uh, let's see. So last but not least, I've got a couple minutes left. Oh no, I've got three minutes rapidly that Anne has also done some wonderful recent work um, with these structural brain networks. Um, so here we took the mean over 24 scans. There's eight subjects, three scans apiece, and we used some parcellation. So you collapse these millions of voxels into these nodes. Um, and then ask about conditions in that, in that network that I showed. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So there's some distributions of cliques in the brain that are interesting. Um, but the, this sort of way more exciting to me, it's like the long-lived cycles, the resulting uh, clique complex. Um, here we've highlighted four of them, so these colored ones, the blue, green, and red, are one cycles, and the purple is a two cycle. Uh, there have to be bits of structures that, if you have any cognitive neuroscience, you have a neuroscientist, uh, uh, what are these? They'll say, oh, yeah, no, those are things that we expect to see. So, um, and I should say this, um, these things, all, all these, when these, when these uh, cycles appear, uh, two on the left appear with a unique minimum length generator, um, which is fantastic. Uh, the one on the right, the top right, those two large gold blobs, are, uh, there are 12 total skull representatives in this mean network uh, of length four. Um, and the gold blobs correspond to frontal and cingulate control hubs, uh, which are things that you want to um, but in the equivalence classes belong to those uh, belong to those hubs. So in some sense, it's saying these two densely connected regions are part of this cycle. Those are places where regions in the brain 
line, can rapidly talk to one another via strong connections, uh, but they can't directly talk across the cycle. So there's a, inf a directed information flow here. This is, this is saying there's, uh, you want this to talk to this so that it can do some processing before that data gets to the next thing. So we've got some reward circuitry on the left. Um, oh, sorry, the top left is just a subcortical interhemispherical communication network. You really want that because you want the two halves of your brain to talk. Um, the next reward circuitry, and the last one, this two cycle is, is super fun because it looks like it has something to do with vision processing. Um, right, you have data sort of splitting going off in a lot of directions and then come back together. Uh, to sort of form, uh, uh, you know, t processed uh, piece of information. Um, and so lastly, so I want to say, you know, of the four, right, so if you take these cycles and you look at individuals, they've all got them. Almost all of them appear in everybody. These are really structures that appear here. Um, and if you do a little bit of this and remove things that, that might come off the rest of your network, so you look at the links of the sort of subcore regions, uh, this simplicial complex, you get these massive cycles. Um, in particular, this one is really nice because it looks like the complete uh, what's called the what where processing uh, circuit in visual uh, information. So, um, right, we just plucked that out of the DSI without any uh, sort of pre processing. And that's really what you want to do, right? You don't want to know anything before you go in, you just want to take the data and come back with something that people were expecting to see. That tells you that your technique is seeing something worth finding. Um, all right, so I'm out of time, so I'm going to thank you all for listening to uh, to this and ask if anybody wants to, to have any questions. Thank you, Ben. So you had a, a few slides slide with bar graphs on it on, on geometric structure. Yeah, let me. Uh... Uh... That one? So is that, is that coming from actual data? Uh, yeah. Early, early on, you were looking at synthetic data. So this is yeah. the recording from actual rats. Okay, so they actually have kind of painstakingly found the the. Oh, so this is this is literally we just uh, grabbed a rat, stuck to the hippocampus, let it do its thing, took the recordings, and uh, stuck them in this click flex correlation machine. So they're just kind of stuck in there some way. They they yeah. might have to find these place fields or anything. But the hippocampus about forty percent. Uh, when that is spatially navigating, about 40% of the cells are placed, and um, then there's some fuzz. There are some other cells that are nominally silent, but many of them aren't. Um, so, sort of, I mean, yeah, but we do any attempt. We made no attempt to uh, pre process data. We literally just took hippocampal recordings during animal states. Okay, so that's cool. That you, I mean, you don't have to like find the place fields in order to kind of detect the homology, I guess. Is that, is that the yeah, that's right. right to the, is, that, is that a reasonable interpretation? Yeah, absolutely. I just right, I think it, what it, what I would say is that it's it's really is telling you that whatever the network is doing at any time, whether they're place fields or not, not okay. Let me add a caveat that I think anybody who's a neuroscientist in the audience, all of these are, are uh, there's so there's uh, a a there's a a thing called theta um, which is just there's a, a high frequency oscillation going on in the hippocampus when the animal is in certain states. All of these are theta states. Um, when you're not in theta states, uh, signatures are weaker. Uh, is essentially, I think, evidence. It happens when the animal is spatially navigating. It happens when the animal is doing basically when it's using its hippocampus for tasks that might be an embedding idea. And if anybody wants to jump in, please, please, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep asking some, I'll keep bothering about more questions. Um, so you, 
a bit later on, you measured the distances between classes of networks. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm distance, but so for each of these networks, you're you're getting you kind of a number of persistent homology based. Uh, right. That way, you're taking the distance between the. the uh, so, so what Anne did is she took each of these model networks and she ran I don't know. Hundred, right, generate hundreds of these things, um, and then we took the uh, persistence diagram and we computed, um, I think, you know, features from list of features. Uh, so we had, a, you know, a twelve-dimensional space. Um, the, you know, each dimension was. So I think we computed Betty zero through three um, for each network, and then so you know, that's eight dimensions with just the betas and the mu's. And then um, also this sort of uh, maximal clique distribution up through size. Right. Some some uh, space like this, and yeah, then we just took Euclidean distance because uh, really, uh, you know, there's there's not an obvious metric on this space um, other than that one. Um, new a better metric for the space. Um, but a very nice job of sort of distinguishing. So, so what you would see is that you know these these uh, these four. If, if you had like a, a two-dimensional representation of this uh, out of twelve two-dimensional space, uh, at least for these small networks and the models that we chose, what you see is that they form this sort of uh, wavy blob along this spectrum, um, where really one is the total number of cycles that you're going to see. Across the dimensions, the one is the largest click that you're seeing at any given time. So, All right, last question. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Peter, can I jump in? Great. Thanks. Yes, please do. Uh, Peter Bala, Krishnamurti. So, you mentioned uh, towards the end, sorry, Chad. Yeah. Uh, this four blob cycle, and the two of them are important. Um, locations are identified by the neuroscientists, I guess, the singlet yeah. frontal. But then there also a notion of uh, so expect uh, to form. So they just expect those spots to uh, communicating with each other. So this, um, this top right one here, uh, right? So the frontal control hubs and the singlet control hubs are expected to be highly interconnected networks, right? So they're peak functionally in this network. Okay. Um, each one of them is a clean. Um, those two have, have at least some some uh, dense connectivity between them. And you have uh, these the nucleus accumbens and the medial medial orbital full. Um, so this circuit, if you show this to a cognitive neuroscientist, they say, "Oh, that's that reward circuitry. That's your brain telling you you did something right." Um, right. So but I was I was trying to see if they actually expect. Or only click. Oh, no. uh, I don't really know what to do. This is one of the nice things about working in neuroscience is you show somebody something and they say, "Well, I didn't have any idea what was going to happen, but that looks like it's probably okay." Um, I mean, it's literally the case that you know, I started out by saying, "I don't really know what neural computation is supposed to mean, what brain networks are supposed to be doing with the computer." Nobody else does either. I'm not like a one in the woods there. So these circuits, I think it really said something like. You know, local processing, you pass the information on to your neighbors, they pass the information on. And this kind of cycle makes sense. Actually, this last one, I think, is really the few places where we explicitly know this should happen. So you get um, visual information into the back of your head. Uh, so it goes in through your retina, it attaches to the V1 area, which is basically directly on the back of your head. And there is feed forward structure that sends different visual information in different directions. So um, upward uh, is the where path, and that eventually terminates in the motor cortex, and downward is the what path. What am I seeing right, right now? Right. You want to do different processing on those two paths, to, and that, that's an extremely fuzzy notion from, from the vision literature and most cognitive vision literature. But, but I'm seeing the seeing the thing uh, sort of uh, you know, people know. Oh, yeah, that's exactly what you should expect. Now that we know that it's there, <laughs> so yeah, I'm only going to ask a more advanced question, but I'm going to ask actually, 
uh, a motivation to look for not just cycles but cycles that are designed in some way maybe shorter cycles or something like that in fact something like that from a neuroscience point of view question i don't think anyone knows um i think you want um short cycles there's a, a very strong interest in minimum energy um hypotheses right you believe that the brain is going to do things the easy way and Absolutely. figure out how to do it and when you see something in particular when you see something that is a minimum energy attachment, that's exciting, right? Mm. So, so cliques should be, right, what, what do we expect if the brain isn't doing anything interesting? Every area is wired to its neighbors and that's it. Mm. So when you see these giant cycles, that, that is interesting, right? Because mm. what I should expect is local cliques that tile a sphere. <laughs> sure. So. Okay, thanks. All right, so uh, thank our speaker again. So thanks, uh, Todd, for a great talk. Thank you. Well, for having me.